Hello, this is Reed here at Tonga Sala Cooperative Farm. I've gotten a lot of interest about the electric conversion work that I did on this uh, BCS rototiller, so I thought I would give a fuller tour because I don't know that I'm going to find the time to do a proper bill of materials and walk through. So, um, basically, this is a BCS 730 that we've had here on our farm for about uh, 13 years. We bought it used. It's been fantastic. These are incredibly durable two-wheel tractors. Normally they're equipped with a gasoline engine and in fact our BCS's gasoline engine is sitting right here along with the collection of other parts that I removed in the process of the conversion but uh, it's now been replaced with an electric motor and all the necessary wiring and uh, battery packs to supply it with power. Um, mostly we did this because on our farm this BCS spends almost all of its time indoors in a couple of large unheated greenhouses where we grow crops and uh, being able to reduce the, the fumes and the noise uh, and also to render the machine a little bit safer. Anyone who's used a BCS indoors knows the uh, frustration of uh, reaching for the clutch lever, which used to live right here. It's now been deleted. But trying to reach the clutch lever as the machine pins you against the wall in reverse uh, is very irritating. And so it'll, it'll be nice to have a BCS that no longer does that to us. Plus, it was kind of a fun uh, technical challenge to make it happen. And uh, now that good batteries are available, there is uh, no longer a big obstacle to this. Really good batteries are necessary for the power output. And it couldn't be done in the era of lead batteries because, as you can clearly see, this machine is balanced on its wheels. And the weight at rear needs to be about a little bit more than the weight at front. And if you put 300 pounds of lead up front, that's, you're going to have to put a whole lot of counterweight on the rear and all of a sudden it becomes useless. So I'm going to uh, put this on the tripod and demonstrate a little bit how it works and then I'll go through the full geek out tour. So normally it's off, main power is here. Um, the little display on the fuse holder is currently lit all the time. If I want to turn it off, I either unplug both the battery packs and then it shuts off. Or I could put in a relay slave to this that would shut it off, but I don't know. haven't gotten there yet. So main power. Uh, right now it's blinking at me to say that it needs a, an interlock cycle before it will be active, so power emergency stop, reset, and then forward or reverse, I select up here with just a rocker switch, and it still has three gears just like it did originally, but one of the benefits of the electrical drive is that I can shift from forward to reverse while operating the machine. In fact, without even releasing the throttle. And the motor controller deals with varying the voltage to the motor and thus the speed. So I'm still in second gear, but if I drop it to first, it's going to make a whole lot more noise. per unit wheel travel. So the mechanical transmission of the BCS is unchanged and the ratio of power delivery to the tool on the PTO is the same as it was before so that in second gear the tilling implement or mower or whatever goes much more slowly per wheel turn and in first gear you get much more aggressive uh, PTO action per unit travel. 
So it's still, it, it's balanced relatively well. Uh, at present, it has a rotary harrow, a, a small rotary harrow that we really like mounted on the rear. Um, when we put the rototiller on as the implement, the rototiller is much lighter and then we can pull one of the batteries off if we want, but it actually works okay with the rototiller and both batteries. Um, obviously the batteries are wired in parallel rather than in series and each of them has a little voltage display. That one's showing 24.4 and not surprisingly that one's at 24.4 also. They actually balance out if I leave them plugged in because whichever one is high gives up a little bit of charge to the other one and they equalize each other. Um, though they don't necessarily equalize on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. Um, I'll talk about the batteries in a minute. But yeah, so the basic overview of the, of the design is that there is, so it's all shut down, shut down. There is a uh, cradle that carries both of the batteries. One, two, and they're just sitting in there. The original BCS bumper is bolted to the underside of the cradle and it keeps the batteries from bouncing out. I don't think it's going to be necessary to strap them down or build a latch or anything. I think it's just going to stay put. Um, so this, this cradle assembly has the motor in the very center of it and then under this upper hood you can see this tips forward and there you have motor controller and a few other parts that you can't see very well here. Maybe if I spin it around the light will be better. Oh boy, it's heavy without the two. Uh, it's very awkward moving it without the batteries because they provide a lot of the weight. So here under the hood, the um, the motor is, yeah, you can see part of the, you can see actually the motor nameplate down there. I'll show you a motor, a duplicate motor that's out. So the motor controller, which would be the same kind of uh, motor controller that would be used in a, an electric pallet truck, um, like one of those. And in fact, that pallet truck now shares batteries with the BCS. Kind of like that, because that's all the battery it needs for a typical day's work. So the motor controller is a, a pallet jigger or a pallet truck controller. This, In this case, it's a, uh, it's a separately excited motor, and so it has to be a controller that is appropriate to separately excited. This one's obviously been rebuilt by FSIP. I can't even see it in the camera, but it's a, it's a Curtis 1243. Uh, and this one's rated for 300 amps at 24 or 36 volts. Uh, I happen to have a couple of these kicking around, so it helped keep my cost down. So, CPEX motor, CPEX controller, Albright contactor for the main power uh, disconnect. I'll show one on the table that's a little bit clearer. And then the rest of what's stashed under here is mostly just wiring. So a combination of logic wiring that runs up to the various controls and interlock switches and also to this switch and the fuse. and So small gauge uh, logic wiring and then larger gauge power cables down to the motor armature and also larger gauge power cables that come out on this side and on this side to run to the high current SB connectors for the battery connection. And when we're just using one battery, I'm trying to encourage people to cap whichever battery is not in use little yellow dummy plug. So this junction box just takes the multi-conductor wire from here 
and joins it up to all of the relevant conductors that come doodly 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 do both up to here where there are a couple of LEDs to give me information about fault codes from the controller and the emergency stop switch which doubles as a, an interlock to prevent starting with the uh, it's like it, the interlock let, prevents you from starting with the um, either with the throttle position too high or with the with one with a direction engaged. So like right now, it's in reverse. It wouldn't let me start until I would reset that to zero and then reset this through a cycle like that. And. There are a couple of wires that actually don't go through this box, but go underneath and behind using these nice little, um, I think this is this other wire harness here, splits in a Y, and one of them goes up that way and the other one comes up this way. One of them comes up to the direction control switch, and the other is a three conductor up to the, uh, the throttle, um, and one, and the, those use these nice um, waterproof three and four conductor connectors that you can buy from Hong Kong or China. And uh, actually, I think I have one out on the table. The thumb throttle, this one here, is the one that I want to use, but I don't have it working yet. Um, it is a electric scooter throttle, so it's a Hall effect. Uh, magnetic type throttle that produces a varies voltage rather than varying resistance and whereas this one that I've rigged up temporarily which I just sort of roll back like that and then it returns to neutral this is a potentiometer and it's providing a resistance signal for the for the motor controller and what I need to do is find a programmer module or a programmer handheld programmer that'll let me tell this guy that I want to switch from a type 1 to a type 2 throttle and then I can s r adopt the the nicer thumb throttle that I bought for the purpose but I haven't yet found a Curtis handheld programmer that works mine is buggy and uh, the first one I borrowed from another uh, forklift shop did not work so anyone who's got a Curtis handheld programmer and wants to mail it to me briefly I'm interested. So that's the basic overview. Um, the the assembly of the the fabrication of the cradle um, parts took quite a lot of time because I was trying to get it as compact as possible. So it it's barely I don't know. It's no longer than it needs to be. There's just clearance here for the front wheels. Um, there's an adapter plate that allows the motor to bolt on to the, this uh, cone where the clutch used to live inside. And basically my goal was to make something as, as compact and tidy as possible because the electric drive has the potential to be bigger and bulkier. And, uh, and starting with a Honda GX motor, the bar is set pretty high. It's a pretty fantastic tiny power plant, so I figured I'd better do a half decent job. Uh, underneath, I think you can see it's kind of skid plated. I think it's, I think I wrapped it in some kind of sheet metal. I can't even tell if it's aluminum or steel, whatever it was around. And, and then the, the bumper is bolted onto the underside, but it's pretty, uh, Pretty abuse proof. The motor, you can just see the the end of it here behind the mosquito net on the intake. It actually draws air in this way, pulls it in over the brushes in the motor, and then expels the air out of the motor at the back end. And down here, you can't really see, but there's a piece of kind of skirt made out of tractor tire inner tube that prevents the airflow from go from cycling and there's another one at the back sealing around the motor and it forces the airflow to go 
after it's gone through the motor, it has to come up this way around the controller, which also generates heat and which is sitting on a big aluminum plate. And then ultimately, that is the heat and air exit. So that's why it's got that funny thing on top is that it's sucking air in here, pulling the air through the motor and then expelling it out around the controller and then up and out through that top vent. And I'm try I've tried to make things at least relatively uh, splash proof, rain proof. Uh, I wouldn't leave it out in the rain for several days but uh, it's pretty good. Like there, I tried to catch most of the details in that regard, and most of the uh, most of the fittings are waterproof. Uh, most of the things that could be sealed, I sealed up. This is not necessarily a waterproof box, but the switch is sealed into it with silicone, and I think I remembered to drill a drain hole in the bottom of it. Maybe not. And. So that's about it for the fabrication and how it fits on the BCS. I'll try to edit in some pictures of the, uh, the mounting adapter plate and that jazz. Um, one thing that's interesting is to look at the Honda motor that came off. So this is a 340cc, 11 horsepower nominal. Um, it's kind of laughable to say that uh, you're going to improve on this as a power plant because these are some of the best gasoline engines ever made and I've never had a, I will probably never have such a low maintenance engine ever again. So hard to argue that the electric drivetrain is going to be lower maintenance, but it is arguably simpler. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The Honda motor is typically has this um, BCS clutch bolted directly onto it and then the that assembly gets mounted into the uh, bell housing on the front of the tractor and then this which way does this go I think it goes like this this is the clutch throw out fork that when you pull on the clutch cable it pushes the center part of the clutch in and the Belleville springs give a little bit. Maybe it's a coil spring, I can't remember. It's some very robust spring. And it allows the two pieces of the clutch to separate while you've disengaged and lets you shift gears and shift the PTO in and stop the machine because you can't stop the motor. Um, the difference with the electric drivetrain is that anytime you want to slow down or stop anything, you just let go of the accelerator and everything stops. And then you can change gears or engage, disengage the PTO, so you don't even need the clutch. So you just take it out and put it in a box. And then you take another clutch, which someone generously supplied, and you cut out the center of it in order to get that splined female shaft, because that is not a normal standard off-the-shelf spline. Uh, it's an involute spline perhaps unique to this application, I don't know, but this was a really easy way to get one, and many thanks to Benoit Sivierge, uh, who repairs and sells BCS. He supplied me with a scavenged scrap half of a clutch to, uh, to make that very easy, and that provided the starting point for the adapter shaft that mounts on the electric motor and then feeds into the BCS transmission. All the rest of this crap came off the BCS. This is cable for the reverser, or maybe, no, that's probably throttle. There's the throttle lever for the gas engine, the clutch lever, clutch cable stop support, uh, safety interlock, safety interlock switch, reverser handle for the mechanical reverser, and then some wiring for the interlock switch and the cable that must be the clutch cable. So all of that was basically in the control end and none of it is necessary anymore. And then all of this was on the drive end and none of that is necessary anymore. So where the, where the clutch throw out lever used to live, I've actually, man, maybe from this side, 
I've actually just covered the hole with a piece of rubber and a zip tie and it'll probably dry out and rot in five or ten years and I'll cut another square of rubber. Seems to work adequately for now. So the BCS, um, other than control bits that have been removed, uh, I haven't actually made any permanent changes to the BCS. It would probably take me an hour and a half, but I could convert this back to gas if I needed to. And in fact, I did that between February and August because I didn't have time to finish the job that I started in February. But then in August, I got motivated and finished it. So here's a closer look at some of the electrical components, just because I have them in duplicate, some of them. I thought I'd get them out on the table. This is the DC motor. This is a twin to the uh, the one I'm using, which is an advanced DC motors. I think they were now called advanced motors and drives, AMD. Uh, there's a duplicate to this that's available from D&D &D Motors. Uh, it's called the ES10E33 or something like that, but uh, it's basically the twin to this DDO4002. This is probably far too big a motor for the BCS, and you can see that it's rated for 36 to 40 and 48 volt operation, and I'm spinning it a little bit more slowly at 24 but having a bigger than necessary motor lets me run it at a lower voltage and still get enough power out of it. This is almost the same motor that is used in uh, Alice G conversions. It's the same frame and case from ADM, uh, AMD, but it, the one used for the Alice conversions tends to be a series wound variant called the uh, something or other 4009. At any rate, I'm pretty sure it shares a lot of parts, except this is a, a separately excited motor, and therefore the field windings are much finer. Uh, the field, the studs for the field windings are, are much smaller gauge. Much less current goes through the field windings, and it means that the controller in a separately excited motor can do the, uh, can do the reversal of the motor without needing a reversing contactor, which is nice for this kind of application because then you just need one contactor of this type. There are a couple others here that we're kicking around, so I thought I'd show them. So a contactor is just a big burly switch, magnetic switch, that pulls that great big copper bus bar down on a couple of contacts and has the capacity to release the switch and break the contact even if there is 400 amps running through it at the time. So. Uh, ostensibly the best around are these Curtis Albrights. They're relatively easy to find on eBay. Uh, this Panasonic one I think actually comes out of the Chevy Volt battery pack, but I can't remember what the coil voltage, voltage is. It might be 48, but it might be 12. Um, and these are some Tycos that I had. These are those, uh, the handy waterproof uh, cable connectors that I was talking about, and they have this kind of threaded gland, and when you pull them apart with your one hand, it doesn't work very well. When you pull them apart with your elbow in one hand, you get one half looks like that, the other half looks like that. Cheesy little O-ring, might keep some moisture out, and then you solder them, solder splice them into whatever you need. Uh, so main contactor, drive motor, controller. Um, so this again is a CPEX controller. These are a couple of um, series wound controllers that I had that are also out of small lift trucks or, or jiggers. And so these are also models that you can go hunting for. Uh, Curtis 1207 and this is the 1207 second generation. No, this is the earlier one. That's the later 1207, 1207A. Those are pretty easy to come by and if you can find one of those and uh, an appropriate series wound motor, maybe from a golf cart. You could totally use that and keep the mechanical reverser in the BCS transmission and the lever on the on the handlebars and do it that way. And then I just used a rocker switch like that or like that for forward reverse and got little project boxes like this from a local electronics and hobbyist store and cut holes in them and mounted them hit hither and yon. 
This is a nifty little thing that turns out to be only a partial success. It is a fuse holder. It's an A&L fuse holder for big, beefy A&L fuses like this. And it also has an integrated ammeter and voltmeter. Its intended market is car audio. And as such, the uh, internal logic makes the voltage display always just show high for mine because I'm showing it, I'm giving it 24 volts and it says you have a problem with your 12 volt system, it's at 24. But the ammeter is, is neat and that's what I really wanted. Um, I have voltage visible on my two battery packs, but I wanted to have the instantaneous current draw through the motor and controller and it does provide that and it's, it's kind of neat. And this was, this was cheap, it was like 25 bucks or something. Um, though I've had trouble finding them online. I just happened to find it at a store in Montreal. And I like these little switches, especially if you can get the right light bulb and make them light up, because switches that light up are just so satisfying every time you turn them on. And here's another one of those goofy little scooter uh, throttle assemblies. My recollection is that these are about four or maybe it's seven dollars. But you have to order them ages in advance from Hong Kong, so it's irritating when you discover that your controller won't listen to that particular type of throttle signal. Uh, tools I'll come back to. Batteries. This is a... The, the starting point for my batteries are these uh, 24 volt modules. Six in series... Six uh, pouch cells. These are from Chevy Volt batteries. So in between each of these plastic layers is a prismatic pouch cell and the six of them that are pinched in the sandwich are all wired in series and you can you can pick them up here on top or you can pick them up out of this block connector which I've brought out to a balance charger connection the standard RC uh, world JST XH these are called so that I can balance them by just opening the cover and plugging a balance charger in. These batteries from LG Chem are so good that they really don't need balancing very often. I've been doing it um, far more than necessary. I have a friend who used batteries, these uh, Chevy Volt batteries in a car, and he said balancing them once a year has proved adequate, and that's a car that he's driving almost every day. Anyway, these Chevy Volt batteries are fantastic. They are so robust and so durable and they're a chemistry that discharges uh, the voltage drops very linearly with discharge so it's really easy to know what your state of charge is by just plugging a little four dollar voltmeter into the top of your case and then you have a rough estimation of where you're at in the discharge cycle without having to do anything fancier than that. So this is a, a couple more bricks of the a couple more of the battery packs in the process of being assembled. Each of them gets another ANL fuse directly in the box with so that there's no danger of no significant danger of short. And then they also get a, a charger port, one of these XT60 connectors uh, bolted into the, the corner so that you can charge them without having to open the, the waterproof case. And I've only got two of them assembled now, so I need to get these other two up and running soon, but uh, I'm really happy with them. Quick word on tools, if you tackle this, the most basic tools that you need are wire strippers and pliers and so forth. If you decide that you want to fab up your own connectors, You'll discover that most of these Curtis controllers and others have others, but uh, the Curtis controllers use a plug that looks like this. They're about, I don't know, 40 cents or maybe a dollar if you order them. And then they come with these, you, you get the matching tiny little pin doodads in a strip. And then you get an appropriate crimping tool and you crimp them onto the end of your wire and then you push them into the back and you make careful notes of everything you do and plan it all out and you build your own wiring harnesses and the cost in money is very low, the cost in time is 
not entirely trivial. Decent voltmeter, uh, doesn't need to be clamp on, but you need to be able to measure voltage and continuity and a couple other things to get through this kind of a puzzle uh, ably. And then the other things that you might need would be, this is one of those Curtis handheld programmers that you can plug into the controller and then change parameters. This one is buggy, and so it's not being a lot of help, but you might need to borrow one of those from a forklift repair technician in order, for instance, to tell your 1207 controller that in fact you want to feed it a voltage-based throttle signal rather than a resistance-based throttle, throttle signal. So you might, that's a specialized tool that you might not want to own, but you can probably borrow. Similarly, um, the high current connections like uh, these cables with these big crimp on ends, there are a variety of different ways that you can crimp on ends and you can buy the ends for a buck or two a piece. And if you're inclined to collect tools as I am, then you can go on eBay and find yourself a hydraulic crimper die thingy, die crimper, whatever the hell these are called. And then you can make really pretty, super um, low resistance fittings that are appreciably better than, than these, which came from a commercial forklift, I think. Oh no, from a battery charger. So that's another tool that you might not want to own, but it might be handy to have for the, uh, for some of the steps. And yeah, I think I'll, I'll put a battery back in and turn it back on and then demonstrate just how much noise it makes with the, with the tool running. So there is the, uh, the voltage and amperage display. If I turn it on, I'll still get nothing. I'll put the, uh, I'll put the transmission in neutral and that way I can spin it, spin the motor without having to uh, have it chase it across the room. And now if I set it in forward and spin up the motor with the throttle. You can see it's drawing, even if I spin it up to full speed. So at full speed in neutral, the motor draws 11, was that 11, 12? I don't even remember. Ah, see if I really crop on it. So depending, when you, when you accelerate hard from a stop, that's when you actually get big instantaneous current draw. It peaked at about 30 some, um, but then it stabilizes down at 11, 12. If it's actually in gear and having to pull the machine around, it tends to draw about uh, 15 to 30 amps. And if you put it in third gear and run across the farm with it, it draws, uh, I think it draws about 20 or some amps if it's not got any drag on it. The thing that we found that really pulls a lot of current is uh, if you put it in second gear and put the rototiller in the ground and run the rototiller in second gear, it draws upwards of, it, it peaks over 200 amps, which turns out to be the limit for the ammeter in here, and then both sides just say high. But uh, in first gear, it only draws 60 amps rototilling. So it's interesting that the, uh, well, it's the, the difference between the gearing down. So that at the, at the much uh, shorter gear ratio, it draws a lot less current because the torque demand is that much lower. But it's neat to have the, the instantaneous feedback, even though it flutters a bit. So yeah, that's about, that's how noisy it is with no, so that's just the motor speed spinning some of the gears inside the BCS transmission, and then if I engage gears, it's gonna make the additional noise of now the differential and the wheels and all that jazz that's having to spin too. And then if I engage the PTO, which, you know, being a BCS, of course, the PTO is gonna be tricky to so now the PTO is engaged, and I'm just going to make sure that it's up off the ground so that the rotating tines, which will 
I don't know if you can see them. Let's see. Oh yeah, you can see some debris being dragged around underneath. So now we have the noise also of the uh, implement. Now it should be pretty noisy. But still, no need to put on ear protectors. It's still a, a lot quieter than a Honda or any gas engine at full throttle, which is what you kind of got to run it at. So we've been using this in the greenhouse and finding that it's uh, totally, yeah, pretty much fantastic. And we're pretty happy with it. And uh, yeah, I'll post this and uh, I'll try to answer questions in the comments and I will uh, maybe someday get around to writing up some of this information in an Instructables or on, uh, on the Farm Hack site or something like that. So thanks for watching. Hope this was enough geeky detail for those of you who are into that kind of thing and I'm sure everyone else stopped watching ages ago. Alright, take care. Bye-bye.